Dodger Stadium opened for the first time ever on April 10, 1962. Maybe Dodger Stadium shouldn't exist. I'm a Venice, California-born, Los Angeles-based sports fan. One that has played, coached, announced, and promoted sports my whole life. My love affair with sports started in my own backyard and has led me to this podcast. Thanks to the support of the Amateur Athletic Union in East Bay, I'm excited to bring you Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. Hey, sports historians, welcome. We got a great show today. Today we have the author of Stealing Home, Eric Nussbaum. He's been on the uh, Friday night show twice, but today we get to spend a little bit more time with them and really get into this book. And so I uh, think we should cut to the chase here. Uh, how about we bring in Eric? My director, of course, it's Christine. What up, Eric? What's up, Danny? How's it going? It's hey, going Christine. great, buddy. Do you like that? That was fancy open, huh? It was, yeah. yeah you know, Sorry. do it again. The hey. camera's in the background here. Oh, no, that way, that way, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Eric, um, in honor of you, I did a little um, work today. Uh oh, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, I put this together. There you go. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Um, that's our theme, of course, today is how Dodger Stadium was built. And um, that actually I got at Dodger Stadium one time as a giveaway item, but I just thought I'd show that to you because that's our theme. It is. Dodger Stadium is kind of the theme of my life in many ways. <laughs> yes, it is. So, um, before we, you know, we get we get deeper into the book and the subject matter and stuff, kind of let our uh, viewers and and so forth get to know you a little bit. Um, why don't you give us a little rundown? Like you're uh, born in uh, Culver City, eh? Born and raised, oh, born in born at Cedar Sinai, so not technically Culver City. We moved to Culver City when I was a little kid, and I grew up there. Went to school in Culver City schools. Um, mm -hmm. Moved away when I turned eighteen, and have been back and forth a bit, and now I live in Tacoma, Washington. I'm a journalist, I'm a writer. I've worked at Vice, I worked for, wrote for Sports Illustrated, ESPN the Magazine, Deadspin, places like that. Uh, and now I wrote my first book, Stealing Home. Yeah, and it's, and it's brilliant, by the way. I mean, um, I would probably say that, but with less truth behind it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. Dude, it's so good. I really have enjoyed it and diving in and it goes in so many different directions. So even what we scratch the surface of today, I want to encourage everybody to get the book because because it's 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 a blast. And if you like, you know, history and the history, especially of Los Angeles, uh, migration of the Communist Party and its influence and, and so forth, all of these things that intertwine into the building of the stadium that we all love that have been there. Um, it's it's just it's a really good book, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's also a baseball book too. In yeah. addition to other things. <laughs> it, it, it really is. So, you know, I, I thought what what I do is just kind of throw out some, you know, themes or ideas in the book, and then you just kind of talk on them. Some of them we hit on our Friday night show, but not everybody was there. And so, you know, probably have some new people watching today. So if I just go ahead and throw these out, then you can kind of weave them together, I hope. Um, yeah, that's cool. you know the material, I take it. I hope so. <laughs> um so one of the guys um, I found interesting, but let me first start with uh, Abrana Ari Arichiga and her Abrana family. Arichiga, yeah, so she is sort of the main character of the book, and she is a woman who she's no longer with us, but she was born in a town called Monte Escobedo in Mexico, and she came to the United States as a teenager during the Mexican Revolution. Uh, while pregnant, she immigrated to a small town in Arizona called Morenci. That was a copper mining town. And that's where she lived with her first husband. Uh, when he passed away, she remarried to another guy from the same town in Mexico, Monte Escobedo, uh, named Manuel. And they eventually, after the copper industry collapsed at the end of World War I, moved to LA. And they moved to a little neighborhood called Palo Verde, which is not Palos Verdes, easy to confuse them. It's actually where Dodger Stadium is now, more or less. Um, and they built a little house and uh, they settled there and that was kind of their home. It was not the richest neighborhood, uh, there's their house. And, but it was a place where you could buy land if you were Mexican American. And that was not the case in a lot of LA at the time. Right. And it was, it was theirs. 
it was it was theirs. Um, so you know, Travis Ravine, what we what we call that now, actually encompassed um, what was it, the Stone Quarry Hills and 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 the surrounding communities there. Yeah, so the the like the phrase Chavez Ravine has been around for a long time because the Chavez there was an actual Chavez Ravine, although it's ironically not where like the stadium is. Um, and there was there's the Chavez Ravine Road that's been there since the 1800s, mm -hmm. but the like the area you could call the Stone, Stone Quarry Hills, uh, those hills kind of encompassed five different ravines. Uh, one of them, Solano Canyon, we still see as Solano Canyon if you you know drive up the back way to a Dodger game. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, one of the things I talk about in the book is that there were three communities in what we now think of as Chavez Ravine, and they were Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. And they were kind of three separate communities, each with their own character. And I make a point to to kind of remind readers that these, it wasn't just one place. It was, it was multiple places, and right. people who lived there you know, didn't identify themselves as being from Chavez Ravine necessarily. Mm -hmm. Quite true. Um, the other thing I found interesting um, was the convergence of when maybe, you know, the seeds were planted in your head to do this story. And that was when a guy named Fred Wilkinson uh, came to your school. You were a junior at Culver City High School and, and he talked yeah. to you. And um, so that's a, that's a really cool kind of interesting story. That's so really cool. So it was Frank Wilkinson. He um, he Frank. was an old older guy at the time and towards the end of his life and he had lived a fascinating and trying life to say the least so he came to our us history class my junior year with andrea mcavoy was the teacher i actually just talked on the phone to her for the first time since that class wow uh, experience her name is andrea spiro now she's a professor in san francisco ah she's gotta be proud oh i, I hope so i sent yeah. her a book uh so That's she cool. So she brought him in to talk about the Red Scare and McCarthyism. He had been a housing official in LA, he was working for the Housing Authority, uh, setting up public housing. And he was sort of the engine behind this project called Elysian Park Heights. And the project was going to evict basically those three neighborhoods that we had talked about and kind of replace them with this really ambitious public housing project with 3,600 units. Uh, but before it could get built, he was outed as a communist at a hearing and it sent his life into a tailspin and also killed the kind of the whole public housing initiative in LA. Was that the 1949 like urban planning? Uh, what was that under yeah. the Truman administration or something along those lines? It passed, passed a big bill called the National Housing Act and that sort of sort of gave federal funding to different cities to build their own public housing. Uh, yeah. Especially after the war, you saw a lot of people kind of moving into cities and especially LA had a huge wartime growth. Um, and there was kind of a lot of debate still about like, what's the best way to house people? Is it through private home ownership? Is it through public housing? And obviously we know public housing didn't really win that battle. What was the um, community like? I mean, um, you'd, you'd really draw it up well as far as, you know, how that community acted in, in that area, um, how they kind of lived day to day and were almost like a subset of Los Angeles. Yeah, they were kind of, I mean, in many ways, a normal community, a small town almost within L.A., you know, it had its own culture, more or less. They had a church, they had stores, they had, you know, everything else. People went to work downtown or in, you know, offices or in train yards or whatever it was, uh, just like anybody else. But they also had this experience of being a little bit isolated, you know, that they were kind of hard to get to. There weren't a lot of ways in and out of the hills. It wasn't like now when you go off the way into a Dodger game, although... Pretty easy to argue that Dodger Stadium is still very hard to get to for most of LA. Uh, they, they couldn't use Vince Scully Drive. No, they, they could not. So no. they 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 could use Bishop's Road, and uh, they they especially after the freeways were built. Actually, the 110 especially, they became more isolated because right. the freeway kind of cut off their neighborhood from downtown and from a lot of kind of East LA. Um, it was it was its own place. And it was also part of LA at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, there's there's these other intersecting um, times in history that play into this, and one is the Mexican American War, and and towards you know the tail end of that, and this convergence of or this folklore that played yeah. out about baseball and Abner Doubleday and Santa Ana's leg. It's it's a beautiful yeah. story. I made you tell it on 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 the Friday show, but again, we may have some new people listening and. And it's just kind of fun to hear that folklore. 
Sure. So the folklore I talk about, and one of the big themes of the book is baseball, and obviously mm -hmm. but like why LA was so desperate to get a baseball team and into the 50s and why baseball was so important. And so I wanted to talk about that in the context of Mexico and the context of LA. And one of the stories I came across, and this is when I was living in Mexico City, was that the first game of baseball played in Mexico was played with the prosthetic leg of General Santa Ana during the Mexican-American War. Uh, and the story goes that after the Americans beat him in a battle in this town of Jalapa, Abner Doubleday, who is supposedly the inventor of baseball, but not really, picked up his wooden leg that was left on the battlefield and said, oh, yeah, I can use this to play my new game I just invented. And he told the soldiers how to play baseball. Uh, um, it's not true at all. But the fact that that story got repeated as myth for so long, and, I mean, like, it's in old guidebooks about Mexico, <laughs> uh, yeah. is pretty, it's pretty telling of how Americans kind of thought of Mexico and thought of baseball. Would it have been like a 38 ounce, 40 ounce bat? What are we looking I mean, at? On that? So the regiment that won that battle, quote unquote, uh, was the Illinois Volunteers, I believe. And one of his prosthetics remains in the State Historical Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Oh. So you want to go see one of Santa Ana's wooden legs. Uh, yeah, I want to take a little batting practice with it. I have not been, but I'd like to make a road trip one day. Nice. Okay. Um, let's take a, one of our uh, listeners says, this is Cheryl uh, Huntington Franco. She says, I'm wondering if Eric has received any feedback on the book from the Dodger organization. No. Hmm. <laughs> it's a simple answer. They, have, uh, they haven't, they have they didn't really cooperate that much. Uh, they weren't really interested in the book. Um, I don't think they've really commented on it now. Um, I can get to the... Uh, um, Dave Roberts' niece. I interviewed her recently. So if you, if you want to comment, she's in ninth grade. She could lay it. questions the other day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I had another part of this that was interesting, and it was the life of how Al Albert Spalding and Theosophy, the 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 this mm, cultish type religion, kind of played into all of this. Yeah, so they played into the invention of Abner Doubleday, right? The myth of Abner Doubleday as the inventor of baseball. That came directly from uh, Albert Spalding, who we think of Spalding and Sporting Goods. Well, he's the Spalding, you know, whose name is on the Sporting Goods. He was a professional baseball player in the early days of the sport and then a manager. And he created this kind of Sporting Goods empire. And part of it was by marketing baseball itself. Like he said... I'm going to make myself rich selling baseball equipment by getting people to play baseball and believing baseball is this great game. And part of the reason we call it the national pastime now and think of it in this way is because of, uh, excuse me, Albert Spalding's marketing skills. He was a genius marketer and he invented pretty much Abner Doubleday as the father of baseball because possibly Abner Doubleday was in this spiritual religion called theosophy that yeah. Spalding's wife was also in. So it really kind of just came down to that, arguably. I heard the Theosophists were really good at hitting the off-speed pitch. Yeah, it, the early off-speed pitch, the primitive 19th century off-speed pitch. Um, water was invented. So, you know, what, one of the um, the things that, that was interesting in here, you kind of dove into what was baseball in and around. Um, oh, and by the way, um, Christine will run up um, on there where the book, book can be purchased along the way, oh. um, which I think is stealinghome.la, right? www.stealinghome.la. There's, Good. there's lots of links to different like bookstore of your choice on there. Yeah, so there we go. Okay, cool. Um, one of the um, the things you kind of dive into all the different parts of you know Los Angeles that had it and whether it was the Angels had started and so forth. And one of the teams was the Vernon Tigers yeah. who worked from Dodger Stadium. And then they moved, and the, I'm interested because I was born and raised in Venice. And um, they moved to Venice, I guess, for a short time. Briefly, yeah. They briefly moved to Venice, and then they moved back to Vernon, and then they were going going back and forth. And I think at one point they took their stadium in Vernon apart and reassembled it, like on the boardwalk in Venice for a few years. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. That would have been like early 1900s. I'm not an expert on this, but there are some historians who've like dug into it pretty deeply. Yeah, that's uh, cool. it was a weird time in LA. Yeah, right. Because because oh, you know LAPD was in and of itself. They were they were running the joint and then there was these different immigrant groups that all behaved in different ways. Yeah. A lot of it had to do also with like where you could legally buy and sell booze. Mm -hmm. And 
teams always wanted. The Vernon Tigers were owned by a beer company, uh, the Mayor Beer Company, I think it was called. And so they wanted to be able to sell beer at games. And right. at certain points, it wasn't legal to buy and sell beer at Sundays on Sundays in Vernon. So I think they started playing in Venice on Sundays so they could sell beer. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's it's along those lines. I mean, uh, it makes Venice would be the place you could you could buy beer on Sundays. There's a couple of other things I wanted to hit. Um, one was, uh, and, and I'm sorry to go off for a second, but I, I have to ask you this. I, I was doing my deep, dark research, and you were in Mexico City, and um, and you did some kind of uh, in, like lucha libre and wrestling down in Mexico City. You, you, did you do a book or a long series magazine I article? I did articles on it um, when I was living down there, and one after I moved back to L.A. Uh, yeah, I covered it. I, I really got into it when I lived down there. I, I love it. Um, you know, hey, wonder, was that why you – also, were able to research and find where Ari Chigas were from and so forth. That wasn't really part of it. It was that came a little later. Uh, but I did, you know, when I was living in Mexico City, there used to be this place called the Baseball Archive. That's what it was called. It was in a private house in Mexico City, and it was run by this multi-millionaire kind of mogul in Mexico named um, Alfred Harp Helu. Uh, and he owns a couple of baseball teams in Mexico, and he's a big donor to kind of the cause of baseball in Mexico. I think he owns a piece of the Padres too now. Oh, wow. And he okay. had this house, and he just had it full of baseball, Mexican baseball artifacts and kind of old magazines and books. And I somehow finagled my way in there, and I would just go through these old magazines and these old books and learn about Mexican baseball. And it was kind of this magical place right in the middle of a residential neighborhood that um, opened a lot of doors for me to kind of understanding this stuff. That's really cool. Um, you know, before uh, we go to our, our break, then we're going to come back and talk some more. A um, couple of things. What about the role of Robert Moses, you know, the the dominant force in and around New York City in driving, in effect, driving our beloved Charlie Dodgers out of Brooklyn? Yeah, he's a hero in L.A., right? I think um, it really, well, it depends who you are in L.A. If right. you read the book, you'll see that. Uh Robert Moses was sort of this all-powerful bureaucrat in New York, and he and Walter O'Malley, the owner of the Dodgers, were, I guess you could call them rivals. Robert Moses didn't really care about baseball, and he he had a huge ego, and he kind of wanted baseball to exist within his vision for public land and parks in New York. And he wanted the Dodgers to play in a publicly owned stadium in Queens. And the Dodgers and Walter O'Malley in particular in the 50s wanted to build a privately owned stadium in Brooklyn. With and more parking. What's that? With I, I think I think more accommodating yeah. to their fans. With parking. And he really the place that he wanted to build it is actually across the street from the um, Atlantic Avenue stop where the Brooklyn Nets play now. So uh, it would have been a good spot for a stadium, probably. But yeah. the they just they didn't see eye to eye. And it was you know, a clash of titans. And ultimately, O'Malley said, all right, if you're not going to bend to my will, I'm going to leave town. I'm not going to bend to yours. So he left. And that's how the Dodgers got got to L.A. pretty much. That's brilliant. Um, you know, we're going to uh, do a quick commercial break because we get free food from Casablanca when we do shows. So if we don't run the thing, we don't eat. Were they, were they around when the Vernon Tigers were around to serve? They, they probably could have been. Well, good man. You know, so that they've been here before. Uh, I mean, they've been here ever, ever since the, I know. Let's roll the commercial. Vámonos a Casa Blanca. Vámonos a Casa Blanca. Vámonos a Casa Blanca. La comida para la familia. Vámonos a Casa Blanca. Vámonos a Casa Blanca. Hi everyone, Marley here. I just wanted to come in and tell you about our social media and make sure you're following us. If you want to email the show with any cool or interesting stories, you can email us at info at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Denny's Twitter is at sportsstoriesdl. You can go tweet him, tweet at him. Um, our Instagram, you can go find us there. We post daily. Uh, it's sportsstoriespodcast. 
Next is our Facebook. Uh, Facebook is where we put our live shows every day. You can go there, facebook.com slash sports stories podcast. Next is our YouTube. Make sure you're going and subscribing to our YouTube channels. This is where we house all of our Thursday podcasts as well as all of our Facebook live events. And please subscribe to us wherever you listen, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Um, just make sure you're pressing that subscribe button so we can keep moving the show forward. And finally, we're bringing you some fun and interesting stories on Facebook every day of the week. So join us for our Facebook Live at 5, and that's Pacific Standard Time. So tune in. Thanks, everyone, for following the show. Make sure you're pressing that subscribe and like button and help and us help grow, us the, grow show. the show. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. There it is. See that right there? That's how you get your food if you're a star in Los Angeles and you come on our show. Very, very professional what we're doing here. Again, remember the uh, book we're looking at, uh, we're you know going deep dive today, is Stealing Home. Eric uh, Nussbaum, we're happy to have on the show. So uh, enough of just me. Let's bring Eric back in. Okay. <laughs> right. E-Rock is back. Um, did you like those commercials? Oh, they're great. Yeah. You make me hungry, though. I know, right? They're, I mean, been, if I'm you were uh, living down this way, did you go to Casablanca at all? Yeah, I used to work in Venice, so I'd, I'd go down there sometimes to eat. Where'd you work? I worked at Advice uh, when I worked. It was on the corner of Venice and Abikini. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, where I grew up was on Harding Avenue, not far from there. And um, one of the things we did, uh, I have a big family, and we – um, we played a lot of volleyball, like at the beach and stuff, but we started in the backyards of Venice, something called the Venice Backyard Championships. And it grew into this huge legendary event that took up, you know, five backyards and three front yards. And we block off these blocks. Oh, wow. and a thousand people would just convene and it became a huge reunion. And so we're starting a show on a, on the Facebook Live tomorrow to remember those days, which was like 1983, cool. 1996. I can yeah. imagine that happening now in Venice, seeing the way someone no. else is looking. <laughs> Yeah, when, when when all the homes started to sell, we wanted to put it into the uh, buying rights that you know you had to host the tournament, but it didn't go. Well. <laughs> um, you know, Eric, uh, when I got to go real deep on my baseball knowledge, I bring in my guy from the Global Baseball League and JD Media. His name's Jake Downey, and it's a big game, Jake, and we call him Big Game Jake. How you doing, buddy? How are you guys? I've been enjoying listening to your conversation. Good. Um, we're gonna let you join. I think. Please. Right, nice of you. Thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, Eric, uh, uh, I've been enjoying the conversation. And also, I can tell that you're a journalist uh, like me who's bounced around uh, quite a bit. Uh, we came along at different times. So uh, it sounds like you rolled right into the digital age of journalism. Um, whereas when I got out of school, I, I came into the last vestiges at least in television, of uh, the analog generation. Uh, I guess they would call that legacy media. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, reading about your resume and where you've gone and what you've covered. Um, specifically to this story, though, I am, I, I'm imagining that, that you're fluent in Spanish if you worked in Mexico City and uh, were a journalist down there. Uh, how much easier was it for you to gain entree to many of the uh, people in this story being able to just pick up the phone and speak English and Spanish? I think it helps. I mean, I, I'll shout out Culver City Unified School District for uh, having Spanish immersion and my parents for putting me in it and teaching me Spanish as a kid. Um, I grew up speaking it and, you know, it's still a work in progress. I'm, I'm not a native speaker necessarily, uh, but I, I think it helps, you know, to establish trust. And, you know, most of the people who I, I spoke to are native English speakers, or, or at least they're fluent English speakers. You know, people who grew up in L.A. Uh, speaking both with their parents are kind of the older generation of people who lived in those communities. Um, so, I mean, they could speak English to me, but they also, they might want to swear in Spanish sometimes. Or uh, I think the fact that I speak Spanish and I'm able to listen if they feel like switching to Spanish has helped. Uh, it 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 hasn't been like one of those things where I could have only done it if I spoke Spanish, but I think it's helped me. I think living in Mexico helped uh, kind of give me context too for how to write the story in a way that was more than just kind of like, here's what happened. Eric, I heard a good joke about Hector Espinino. I think it was Espino. Um, oh, you really? You really do. Yeah, I, yeah. The Mexican. You want to you want to tell the joke? I'll give you the laugh. I, no, go ahead. I, I'm not sure if I could recall it. It was something to the effect that uh, Espino arrives at the pearly gates 
and um, St. Peter doesn't recognize him and asks God what he should do. And God says, don't be a coward. Pitch to him. Yeah, Hector Espino uh, was the Mexican home run king. Kind of, he's like the Babe Ruth or Saraharu O of Mexico. And he was this great player in the 60s and 70s, especially, who kind of didn't want to play in the States. He he had many opportunities to, and he almost certainly would have been a big star. But he, for whatever reason, it just didn't suit him. He, um, he went to one spring training, um, I think it was the Cardinals organization, and there was a kind of dispute over his contract. At the time, uh, when a major league club bought a player, bought a player's contract from Mexico, the player didn't have to get paid out. It was sort of like players just sort of like a pawn, right? And he said he demanded a, a large cut. He said, if I'm going to go change countries and change teams, you got to pay me. And they didn't. And he said, well, I'm staying. And that was it. He stayed. And now if you see a player getting purchased from a Mexican league team, you know, they get a negotiated percentage. But – that's all because of him. Hmm. Oh. It also speaks to the value of the union, uh, the baseball players union among the, the four unions of the big sports just operates uh, with great power. Um, I've always been a fan of Marvin Miller and uh, the way that he created this union and coming from the steel workers, he uh, didn't really look with any romance upon baseball players as uh, playing a game, he said, hey, these are highly skilled men who do something that very few can and they should be compensated accordingly. There was no romance about it. It was really just this is what they're worth and this is how underpaid they are. And he sought to uh, address uh, decades of inequity uh, for players. So uh, it, it's nice to see finally that Miller is in uh, or will go in the Hall of Fame, even if uh, he had to pass away, and his family had to say, uh, we don't need to show up or have this honor. Uh, it's still nice to see him honored. And it, a, a particular outrage that he was uh, so inducted after Bowie Kuhn. You know, Jake, you, you bring up the um, labor union part, and I just wanted to go back into like that 40s where uh, Wilkerson was, you know, tagged as a communist or whatever, but he wasn't the only one. I mean, at the time, the United States was allied with Russia in, in the war in Europe, and and it it just seemed odd to me that he was so ostracized for that or 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 am i getting it wrong when he was brought up on these charges well i, I can tell you from personal experience i grew up next to a fellow who was an actor uh in that time and he lost his career uh getting swept up in the red scare of hollywood and uh even as a kid uh growing up in laurel canyon in the uh, 60s and 70s uh there were two dads of kids the same age who one wouldn't be in the same room with the other because one talked and one didn't. So I, I found about, out about this in adulthood, but my parents were telling me everybody had to know where Murray and Paul were because there was going to be tension and it all stemmed back to the Hollywood blacklist of the late 40s mm -hmm. and Joe McCarthy's hunt for communists in Hollywood. Um, and that may be slightly different than what you're talking about, but it was at the same time and it's the same Red Scare. Yeah, it was at the same time. It's the same thing, pretty much. I mean, it's all part of the bigger kind of picture of, of the Red Scare and of the House and American Activities Committee. And what happened in L.A. was that, you know, in the kind of fervor of anti-communism and fear of communism, even when we're talking about like the communism that they talked about, that these quote unquote communists were, they weren't like, you know, marching off into the snowy valley of Russia with rifles. They were um, just kind of pr liberal progressive people who kind of thought that was the best way to to make a better world. That was probably, probably not that far off from like progressive politics in the States today that we might call democratic socialism. But you know, I can, oh, go ahead. Uh, in the time, you know, the Communist Party was sort of the main organizing vehicle for that politics. And being in it, um, could really cost you it and it ended up costing Frank Wilkinson and kind of real estate interests in LA were able to use that to really just destroy public housing as a as a viable possibility sorry wow. Jay. yeah yeah no you know in in uh, uh probably about 15 years ago I talked to a fellow named Lester Rodney I don't know if you remember that name he yeah. was the sports editor of the the Daily Worker which was the communist party newspaper in America. And there was even some debate as to whether to have a sports section 
in the Daily Worker, but he was the first editor and he would cover baseball. And they looked at baseball as uh, a leisure pursuit for the working man. Um, and Rodney was an unabashed communist and covered Major League Baseball and was celebrated as one of the earliest advocates for Jackie Rock, well, sorry, for uh, uh, black players inclusion in Major League Baseball. It turned out to be Jackie Robinson. But he was the one in the pages of the Daily Worker saying, uh, what is this great injustice in the land of the free and the home of the brave that not everybody can compete equally? Yeah, one uh, of the people I talk about in the book is Paul Robeson, who was you know, a famous entertainer, but he was also a great athlete in his day. He played baseball in college and football, all-American football player, and he coached Lou Gehrig in baseball at Columbia. I mean, he, uh, yeah. but he uh, was along you know, with Lester Rodney in the early 40s, one of the leading advocates for breaking the color barrier. And I talk about this in the book later on, Jackie Robinson gets roped into testifying against him at the House Un-American Activities Committee even though Robeson is one of the reasons that Jackie Robinson was able to even break the barrier. And it's sort of the tragedy of America. You take two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. And it's kind you of, know, the, the, oh, the, the pissing match between uh, Walter O'Malley and Branch Rickey had a lot to do with Walter O'Malley's jealousy towards Rickey for getting more credit for elevating Robinson to the big leagues. I mean, yeah. it sounds like it was at the center of the dispute that, that forced the the divorce of Ricky and O'Malley. Yeah, I, I honestly don't get into it in the book, but it's really fascinating. And it's like two of the most, I mean, you could argue two of the, the two most important executives in baseball history, at least in the early kind of first half of the 20th century. And they were with the same organization for a while. And it's not a shock that it didn't work because they were both really, really self-important guys. Can you follow uh, what happened well, to and eventually, um, Eric, because I know you did when you did your research, you worked with his his widow and some of his children on the interviews and so forth. But I know he was a young man in college, what UCLA and and so forth and so on. But then when he did get caught up in the Red Scare, what, what how did that play out for him in the long run? So he was testifying in an eminent domain hearing about the land that would become Dodger Stadium, and he was asked to name his political affiliations, right? And that's a code word for are you a communist? At the time, there was you weren't asked directly. It was all sort of indirect. And he listed his political affiliations and finally realized they were trying to get him to say Communist Party, and he refused to say it. And immediately, pretty much, he lost his job. His wife uh, was a public school teacher and an activist as well, and she also got fired from her job at LA Unified, um, along with about a dozen other teachers. And that doesn't get talked about very much, but it happened. Um, he went to work in a department store working the night shifts from a friendly Ooh. department store owner as a security guard, uh, making a quarter an hour. You know, the family was pretty much living off of the kindness of fellow activists and Communist Party members. He eventually became a full-time anti-HUAC First Amendment activist, Frank did, and he even served time in, in federal prison um, for in his efforts to abolish the House and American Activities Committee. Wow. Wow. What a tragic end for him. Yeah, I mean, he ended up, I mean, he got out and he lived a long life and became celebrated, uh, at least among people who share his politics, and has had a historically large FBI file. The FBI had been following him for like five decades, and they had this insanely, insanely huge file that the that Frank sued for successfully in the 80s, too, which is pretty interesting. I've actually had other friends who requested their FBI file, and that's some uh, glorious reading once you get your hands on it. Oh, I bet, yeah. Your own FBI? I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. You, well, the, my friend had worked in the State Department, was by no means an activist or a, a rabble rouser, but he still had a fairly sizable file that through filing a Freedom of Information Act, uh, he was able to finally get, and it was about three inches thick, and uh, he and his son uh, had a good time sifting through it. Uh, Eric, when I came across the story, it was LA Times. And I thought that was, um, it fired me up when I saw that. I was like so excited to see this story. Um, but, you know, families in Chavez Ravine only asked for a fair price for their property is what's said on that homemade um, on that homemade sign. And that's what grabbed my attention. So tell us a little bit more about Abrana and her family and, and, and how that came, you know, to an end. They, they were like among the last to hold out. Yeah, so they were among the last to hold out. There were some families that, so they eventually were evicted forcibly from their home and they 
had to sit and watch their house get bulldozed uh, by LA County Sheriff's de deputies and whoever was, you know, contracted to do the, do the bulldozing. So, but um, some of their neighbors didn't, you know, some of their neighbors ended up having Walter O'Malley given payouts and partly because they were kind of on separate legal paths. They, you know, filed different lawsuits at different times or different appeals at different times. Um, the Erechica family had a dispute over the valuation of their home for eminent domain. So the city told them that their house, and really wasn't a house, it was two houses on three lots, was worth $10,050. Um, a judge made that ruling. And another uh, assessor had said it was worth $17,500. And this was in 1952, I think. So the difference between those two assessments of the house becomes sort of the basis for their legal battle. And they ultimately are just kind of saying, give us the 17,500 you told us you'd give. I mean, that's that's what they said. Maybe they wouldn't have even taken that, but you know, the city refused and refused and refused and refused and finally forcibly evicted them and left that $10,000 in an escrow account as they continued to protest, camping out on the site of their old house <laughs> afterwards um, until finally they left and kind of gradually took the money and really just kind of went on living in LA like everybody else, um, just having undergone this trauma. Would O'Malley uh, have written the check had he known? I don't know. Uh, Eric, was this, do, do I remember it right that this was the first time that eminent domain was used for the benefit of a private party in American history? I don't know about that. I mean, it technically was used for the city, right? Because most of the communities had been evicted to build the public housing project. So um, they were built, they were, I mean, eminent domain was initially used for a public purpose. Um, and then when the housing project fell through, that kind of set off a separate legal battle from the people who hadn't left, you know, for people like the Adechiga family. Uh, and a judge actually ruled that this was illegal. But then another, you know, court, uh, the California State Supreme Court said it was okay because the city of LA voted 52 to 48% to kind of grant the Dodgers the land. And that was sort of the end of it. This, the US Supreme Court had a chance to hear the case and didn't. Hmm. Uh, one of the things Jake does each year, um, Eric, it's pretty cool. He walks from his house um, in, in uh, Jake, how, how long's the walk from? From about North Hollywood Valley Village to Dodger Stadium, it's about 12 miles, five hours. Wow. Uh, we, he does that on a day each year. And, we and walk about four and a half miles from my place to Universal Studios, where we get on the Metro, cut off about a mile going into Hollywood because there's no real sidewalks. And then we go from Hollywood and Highland to the stadium. Whoa. So so that that's kind of fun, but it's you know, it's it's his tradition. We all have these traditions about Dodger Stadium. I listened to you on one talking about how important Vince Scully was to the fabric of Los Angeles. I know I fell asleep um, watching him. Um, I mean, listening to him as a, as a young person. But on that April 10th, 1962, when people came to Dodger Stadium for its, you know, opening day, um, there's some things that were interesting. And, and one is there's no Abner Doubleday Lounge, right? <laughs> I don't know where that went. And then the other was the coloring and how it signified Los Angeles. And I, not everybody knows that even now when they go to Dodger Stadium, what so all the colors of the different levels. Right, like when I was a little kid, there was the bright yellow uh, field level and then the kind of blue, bright blue reserve and the orange loge and the top deck was, was red, um, kind of primary colors. But when the stadium opened, and once again now, if, you'll, if you look closely at the seats, the idea was that the, the coloring of the different tiers of the stadium would mimic the, the kind of the sky, not the skyline, but the, the sand and the sea and the horizon. So it would be this kind of beach effect where you'd be looking at the sand, the yellow seats on the bottom and slowly kind of rising to the ocean and then to the sky. And that's, that's the, that was the vision that O'Malley had. He was a stickler for detail. When he designed that stadium, I mean, to a T, he forgot water fountains. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I mean, <laughs> He um, he really every little detail was was carefully oriented. The um, the elevations of the bullpen mound and um, plates are the same as on the field, you know, precisely because he wanted pitchers to have the effect 
that they would have in the game. He wanted umpires to have separate access from players and not have to see each other before and after the game. So he designed it that way. I mean, all these little minute things you don't even think about um, were built in the stadium from the start. Well, it speaks to why it's still a modern place, what, uh, 58 years later. Yeah. That, that we can go to this ballpark, even with, you know, some serious remodels, that it's still a beautiful place to go, that it's still aesthetically pleasing. Uh, they just poured $100 million into the uh, grand entrance in the outfield after uh, another $150 million uh, on, on rehab about five, six years ago. Um, there's really no talk about replacing it and moving somewhere else because it still is a place that people flock to close to 4 million times a year. Uh, so to think that it's the third oldest stadium in baseball and that the only ones older are Fenway and Wrigley, which are considerably older, really speaks to what you're talking about, which is O'Malley's vision and uh, its lasting, aesthetic, pleasing vibe. You want to hear something crazy? I learned this on another podcast I was on. What's the second oldest park in the National League? Could you tell me? I was going to say Turner Field, but not anymore. No. Oh, um, did you say American League? National second, League. Second, second, league. second oldest park in the National League? Yeah. Well, it would be Dodger Stadium after Wrigley Field, right? Oh, third oldest, sorry. I, I, yeah, third oldest. Oh, third oldest. Okay. Oh, Dodger Stadium. Uh, hmm. Field? It's Coors Field, 1993. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was 95. I was there the day it opened, and I interviewed a high school teammate of mine playing for the Rockies. Really? Who was it? Uh, he's a fellow who passed away named Lou List. Uh, he uh, had a, a short time in, uh, in a Rockies uniform and was uh, dead of Hodgkins about three years later. Oh, that's really sad. Yeah. Uh, yeah good dude. And, and that was your wheelhouse, right, Eric? Um, 90s uh as far as a dodger fan goes yeah i mean that's when i was a kid right i mean 90 early 90s the rookie of the year teams the kind of post-strike dodgers um probably the peak of my like insane fandom and then you know i remember how heartbroken i was when mike piazza got traded that that was like a seminal yeah. moment becoming a cynical a cynical journalist and no longer a baseball fan yeah exactly um so hey guys uh for one second uh stick around because we got quizzes coming up i promised you um but why wouldn't we make some more um food <laughs> commercial time Hi everyone, Marley here. I just wanted to come in and tell you about our social media and make sure you're following us. If you want to email the show with any cool or interesting stories, you can email us at info at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Denny's Twitter is at sportsstoriesdl. You can go tweet him, tweet at him. Um, our Instagram, you can go find us there. We post daily. Uh, it's Sports Stories Podcast. Next is our Facebook. Uh, Facebook is where we put our live shows every day. You can go there, facebook.com slash sports stories podcast. Next is our YouTube. Make sure you're going and subscribing to our YouTube channels. This is where we house all of our Thursday podcasts as well as all of our Facebook live events. And please subscribe to us wherever you listen, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Um, just make sure you're pressing that subscribe button so we can keep moving the show forward. And finally, we're bringing you some fun and interesting stories on Facebook every day of the week. So join us for our Facebook Live at 5, and that's Pacific Standard Time. So tune in. Thanks, everyone, for following the show. Make sure you press, press that, that subscribe, subscribe and like, and like button, button and help and us, help grow, us the grow the show. show. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Um, why don't we go to Marley right now? Let's get a preview on some of the guests that are coming up this week. So let's shoot it over to Venice. Marley, are you there? I hope so. Hi. Am I going to be double with you, Denny, or am I just going for it? Well, I think it's probably going to be just me. So uh, coming up this week Hi. on Facebook Live at 5. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Really? Yeah, go How's for it. Go, go for it this week on uh, – I like your Dodger sweatshirt, by the way. Way to Thanks. team up. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, so, tell me. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow we get to catch up with the VBC, which is the Venice Backyard Championship which is a unique and iconic tournament played in the back. That's Jimmy. Oh, she's not. I've lost her audio. 
Mm, we lost your audio, Mar. There you go. Now you're back. I'm back. Good. Um, so Wednesday, we get to catch up with the president and CEO of the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union, Dr. Roger Gowdy, and he gets to discuss the AAU, COVID-19, and how everything's going with the sports right now. Um, yep. and, and also, we have Catherine Plummer on the show. Catherine is a three-time NCAA uh, volleyball champion and player of the year from Stanford University. Got that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> to discuss her recent international travels. Um, Denny and Roger actually got to meet her. And we got to watch her final game, so it's pretty fun. Uh, finally, join us for happy hour on Friday. Um, we have some special guests for you, including Chris Geeter McGee. Uh, he's a Lakers studio host. Jimmy Lennon Jr., who's going to be our Thursday full podcast. He's coming on the show. Um, so make sure you catch his four-part podcast series on YouTube for the next four Thursdays. And finally, Shay Cotton, who is the subject of an amazing documentary called Man Child, the Shay Cotton Story, A Dream Deferred. He's going to join us, and he's also the subject of next Monday's Long Style interview like we're doing today. So catch us next week with Shay O'Cotton. Uh, Shay Cotton. <clears throat> and make sure you tune in every day at 5 p.m. Uh, it's Pacific Standard Time. So you can catch all these cool stories. And if you can you hear me, if you do miss them live, um, you can go back to our um, website, uh, Sports Stories Podcast, and we archive them all there. So if you miss them, you can go back and check them out. Way to go. Well I done. You. You're, hitting in the, you're hitting in the four spot. And you drove in a couple of runs. It was a big hit. Good okay. job. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. Thanks, Marley. Bye. Back at us right back at us let's bring in the boys again um uh, again high class operation eric <laughs> right yeah 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 uh -huh. i know what you think okay <laughs> um you know um marley mentioned we got some good things coming up but you know i wanted to plug that wednesday show uh dr roger gowdy is the president and ceo of um, the amateur athletic union and there's uh, like close to like a million members 700 something thousand that belong that are playing club sports right now that are just chomping at the bit to get back out there. So that'll be an interesting interview with Roger. And then Catherine Plummer, I've argued in my blog and I'll say it out all the time. I think she's the greatest collegiate volleyball player ever. Three-time national champion with Stanford, three-time player of the year, um, just dominant force. And um, I think she, we're going to see her on the international scene uh, for years to come. So we're pretty pumped about Wednesday's show as well. Um, I got a couple questions and then Jake's got some questions for you, Eric. Let's go to um, opening day at Dodger Stadium. Who did they play that day? Reds. Ooh, who won that game? Reds did. You remember a score? Six to three, I think. And you're good. Do you remember the exact attendance? No. <laughs> no, no. Okay, I just had to get one. No, that was solid, dude. Um, can you give me, uh, let's say, who had the big um, – who had the big hit for the Reds that day? Wally Post. Yes, you're on fire. Uh oh, Jake, you got. I go to Jake for all the tough ones. I might uh, be running out of steam though. Who on the Dodgers um, turned a double play? I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, infielders. Yeah, some infielders did. <laughs> yeah, it was it was Maury Wills, Jim Gilliam, Ron Fairley. I just wanted to bring up some names from the past. Well played. Um, Jake, you want to uh, – oh, actually, here's how we get to know you a little bit, um, Eric. These All are right. rapid fire. Um, do you have, uh, what was your pet's name as a child? Coco. Ooh, was it a dog? Dog. Nice. Uh, favorite sports team growing up? Dodgers. Okay. Um, nickname as a kid? Didn't really have a nickname. People made fun of my last name a lot. Mm. Noose bomb, noose bomb, noose bomb, you know, there's a lot, a lot to work with there. Various. All right. Uh, favorite board game? Monopoly. Classic. Okay. F uh, I like Stratomatic. Did you know that at all? Stratomatic is fun. It was. I, was, it was never right. I played out of the park baseball, that, like the computer version of it. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, favorite main dish? My mom's lasagna. Solid. My wife's lasagna. Kills it. Uh, favorite um, dessert? Ice cream. Okay. Favorite movie? I don't know. I have too many. Um, I'm not. I'm not like a big favorite movie person. I, you know, I'll watch The Big Lebowski on anytime. Um, love The Godfather. Uh, really boring classic choices. Solid. I like Lebowski. Favorite musical group? It just depends on the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
It's good. And people a lot older than you always say the Beatles. If you want to just fall back on that. I like the Beatles fine, but it's not the Beatles. How about that? <laughs> favorite author or uh or you're like your favorite book. Like who did who did you um who did you like coming up the ranks? You know, I grew up like loving um my favorite book when I was a kid, this is a good baseball one. I was obsessed with this Mickey Mantle autobiography called My Favorite Summer in 1956. And it was written by Mickey Mantle with Phil Pepe, who's an old time New York sports writer. And my mom bought it from the 99 cent store on um, Washington. You know, you know that's where it burned yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. That's where she picked it up. And I read it like over and over and over again. I don't know what it was. It, it was like, you know, he won the Triple Crown that year and they won the World Series. And I, but I wasn't a Yankee fan. But I love right. that book. Yeah, it had like stories of him getting drunk with Billy Martin and showing up hungover to the game. And I, for me, as a little kid, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I think that was like on Zanja in Washington or something. Yeah, that right. Was. Exactly. Right where Washington splits, or like kind yeah. of splits, depending on which way you're going. That's it. Sadly, that was my route uh, out of Venice, and then the Crest House used to be there. It's no so, more either. That is so, that. Um, favorite professional athlete right now, or current or former? Yeah. Current. Current? Um, for a Dodger, I'll give Justin Turner. I like Justin Turner. How about former? You know, Raul Mondesi was my favorite Dodger when I was a kid. I was also a big Nick Van Exel fan with the Lakers um, as a kid. I like, I don't know. I can pick a million former fa kind of favorite athletes. Uh, I like the Justin Turner pick. Um, we, you know, go to a lot of Dodger games, watch a lot of Dodger games, and appreciate, uh, really appreciate his support of the military. If you ever watch the military hero, when they walk off, Turner goes out of his way to hustle over, shake their hand, hand a ball to him. He, he seems like a solid guy. Dude, I like I like the way he hits. I like how he controls that bats. So there's something really interesting about it. Um, it was a good interview. Uh, my favorite player before they retired, my two favorite players before they both recently retired were Beltre and Ichiro. So those two, those two are like probably I would like my first instinct would be to go there, but neither one is playing anymore. I know. I know. What's your uh, go-to TikTok dance move? Oh wait, that was for my high school show. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Jake has got some questions for you, Jake. Uh oh, Jake seems to have lost uh -huh. it. So I am here for you. You get yeah. to pick. Try again. You want to try again, Jake? There you now? Are. Can you hear me okay. now? All right. So we have three baseball movies that you get to choose from, and we'll okay. take three questions from one of them. Field Major games, League. Bull Durham, or Major League? All right, Major League it is. Uh, what, did Major, what did manager Lou Brown do with the contract that said Roger Dorn didn't have to stretch? <laughs> You're one for one. What league did Ricky Wild Thing Vaughn most recently California play Pino. before he got to the Indians? <laughs> You're two for two. Uh, all right, give me the actor in the show. He played Serrano in Major League and the President of the United States in his later television program. Man. Yeah. Ding, 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 he killed you there. Three. He killed you. Um, I, I think we have time for the other ones because he's on fire. Let's, let's let him go. All right. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Bull Durham and Field of Dreams. All right, here's Bull Durham. Uh, what was Crash Davis's name for the Tim Robbins character? Oh, my God. I know it. I can hear him saying it. Meat. <laughs> yeah. You're one for one or yeah. four for four, depending on how you look at it. Uh, give us the full name of the Tim it was Robbins Luke character. Lelouch, but I don't remember. Was there like a, more to it than that? Yeah. Uh, Eddie Have Calvin, credit. Nuke Lelouch. Right, we'll give you four and a half out of five. Uh, and which child star did the studios originally want to play the Tim Robbins character? Child star from the eighties. I don't know. Yeah. Want a hint? He played Whitey Ford in another film. Oh, he did. That's right. I forgot that. He also played a high school quarterback. Was it in another James film. Vanderbeek? No, it would have been too young. Uh, who played Whitey no. Ford? I don't even know. I'm, I'm stumped. Anthony Michael Hall. Oh, I can see that. All right, let's, yeah. do, the field, let's do the Field of Dreams. All right, so you're four and a half out of six. Uh, who played Shoeless Joe? Um, it was um, Ray Liotta. All right, five and a half out of seven. Yep. Uh, who played Moonlight Graham? I don't remember. It was Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster. Wow. Man. 
And uh, what redheaded actor played Ren Ray Kinsella's brother-in-law? Uh, uh, oh, well, sorry. I was going to say hint. He's a redhead, but you already know he's a redhead. Oh, I know, I know his face. Um, he's in the West Wing, and he's in all kinds of stuff. He always played a villain. Timothy Hutton. No, not Hutton. Timothy something. Very good. We'll give you another half. Tim Timothy B Busfield. I, I think he kind of killed it on the quiz. Yeah, yeah very good. He's very good. Killed, buddy. Especially uh, for movies that were mostly before your time. Yeah, but they're classics. Like, they're yeah, movies have to be alive. Solid. Sure. Well done. Um, we got, uh, I think. Uh, I, had a, I had a question on that. Oh, we got yeah. a question. Uh, what famous Red Sox players movie was made in Culver City? Okay. Players movie? I don't know. A lot of stuff. Yeah, our, our fans are going to have to come back in with that answer. I'm going to guess it was. Favorite pitch, maybe? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know the answer to that. Oh, I like that. Do you know, Jake? Famous Red Sox player? Huh. Oh. No, Red, uh, Red Sox movie. Player's movie. Oh, a player from the Red Sox. Made a movie in Culver City. Oh, so it, wasn't, it wasn't the Jimmy Fallon, Drew Barrymore movie about them winning the series in 04? I'm not sure. Well, we're going to land the ship, boys. Uh, Eric, Eric, Eric's got to get back to his uh, his boys. They're playing outside unattended because he got here at the last second. He just jumped on and he just left them out back. So you better go take a look at that four two year old. No, I'm back there. Oh no! <laughs> All right, buddy. Hey, um, it's been awesome to get to know this story and to get to know you a little bit, Eric. And really, um, been excited to see the reaction from from around the country and different you know uh, interviews you've done. People are really geeked on this. And um, deservedly so, man. All the accolades. Congratulations. It's been really fun to be on these things. And anytime you need some company uh, for happy hour, let me know. It gives me an excuse to start drinking at five. <laughs> Just like you are standing in. Uh, excellent. All right, buddy. Um, we'll, we'll see you soon. And, yeah, you'll come back. Um, so pump out that next book, and then we, we got you back at happy hour. You got it. Thank you. Take it easy. All right. Thanks, big game. Good Thanks, buddy. Okay. I, I hope you enjoyed tomorrow night right here, five o'clock, the BBC show. Let's roll the roll. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is supported by the AAU. Find a local event and join at aausports.org. And remember, you can catch your favorite amateur sports live stream, replays, and highlights at ballertv.com. Sports Stories, along with East Bay, supports the Heroes Movement, a nonprofit that bridges the gap from mental or physical therapy to getting strong again through strength and conditioning workouts. This free service is available for any veteran of the United States Armed Forces. Visit heroesmovementusa.org for more information. Sports Stories, along with thousands of people across the country, also supports the My Stuff Bags Foundation a nonprofit that provides traumatized children with new belongings and new hope. Learn more at mystuffbags.org. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is a production of Sports Stories, Inc. and is available on Apple Podcasts and YouTube or wherever you listen and watch. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and give us a review. It really helps spread the word. You can find all our social media links, archives, and other info on our website at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Special thanks to the John R. Wooden Course and Wooden's Wisdom. Original music for Sports Stories is courtesy of Lennon Music Productions. Original images by Sienna Lennon Photography. Sports Stories is produced by Marley Rice, edited by Bob McCall, and researched by Teresa Dolan. Additional staff include Christine Jimbo, Jake Downey, Ray Castro, and Buck Magic Lennon. Kick it out, Buck! Yeah, kick it out! Kick it out! Yeah, buddy! <laughs>